Um, okay, we're going to begin. Uh, my name is Jim Genia. I am the editor of Bold Business. Uh, I'll be joined today by my CEO, Ed Kopko. Uh, the title of this webinar is uh, WorkFlex Solutions Beyond Working From Home, Strong Workforce Strategies for a Disrupted World. And folks, we are in a pretty disrupted world. Uh, businesses have had to pivot um, hard to maintain continuity. Uh, how, have they, how have they made these changes? Uh, what lessons can we learn from them? And perhaps more importantly, uh, what business opportunities uh, lie in this disrupted world? Uh, Bold Business is in its fifth year of publication. That means uh, over 2,000 articles on how uh, change and innovation have uh, shaped and guided the business world. Uh, part of the, uh, the talking points in this discussion will come from Bold Business's reportage, but it will mostly come from uh, Ed and his perspective. Uh, Ed is the former CEO of Butler International. Uh, he's also former CEO of Chief Executive Magazine. Uh, he's pretty much had his finger on the pulse of global business uh, for uh, decades. Uh, in fact, he has, uh, over the course of 25 years, managed over $7 billion uh, in successful client projects. Uh, those clients have included Boeing, uh, Caterpillar, uh, and tech and telecom uh, giants such as uh, Frontier and Cred Simple. Uh, in addition, Ed was the head of the National Technical Services Association for 10 years. Um, Ed's going to lead, lead this discussion, but before I hand it off to him, I want everyone to know that, uh, time permitting, we're going to have a Q&A session at the end. Um, Zoho has a chat function. If you have questions, uh, please put them in the chat and I will relay them to Ed uh, afterwards. Uh, also, this video will be up on boldbusiness.com tomorrow. So if you uh, want to watch it again or share it, please share it. Uh, it'll be available. So Ed, uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, why are we having this discussion? Well, thanks, Jim. I appreciate the uh, intro. So, um, so it, it became apparent over the last couple of weeks that companies are really struggling with this environment. Uh, we've got over over half of uh, uh, the world now in lockdown, and amazingly, only about ten percent of the employees in the United States have flexible workplace uh, environments. Uh, the topic of how are we going to reorganize ourselves, how are we going to function during this lockdown period um, is, a, is a very, very timely topic. And we also wanted to address some of the, uh, as you referenced, some of the studies that we've been doing with uh, the reporting on BOLD. We've been talking about new technologies, future changes of how work is going to be structured. And we think that some of the changes that um, as a result of this lockdown, will create permanent changes in the way we work in numerous opportunities. Okay. Uh, so specifically, what are we going to cover today? Well, we're going to um, go through a, a little bit of a look at how workforces are organized now and maybe some evolutionary approaches. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how companies can make some moves to uh, help dis, uh, uh, make themselves disruption proof. And we're also going to share some uh, thoughts on what is going to be on the up or down or winners, losers? As a result of all this disruption, there's going to be significant opportunities. And I wanted to share a little bit of uh, thinking in terms of what might, might, might that be. Okay. Um, so set the stage for us. How did we get to where we are today? And where, like, what, what's going on today? Sure. Let's set the stage. <clears throat> yeah. So, um, if we could go to the next the next slide. Um, so, you know, what I'd like to do is set the stage in terms of how work is done today and some of the evolution that companies make as they kind of grow up from a small, medium business to an international conglomerate, because I think there's some uh, uh, lessons and some insights from that, that look that uh, will be, I think, 
much more emphasized going forward uh, post pandemic. So uh, the typical workforce that uh, would be for lots of the venture capital companies and everything else would be a cool workforce, people having very social environments, uh, the square footage per employee quite low, uh, shared desks, shared conference rooms, couches, all kinds of things. In today's world, germs, germs, germs would be all over the place, but, you know, to many, many companies, and we've interviewed a lot of CEOs through this process, particularly in the earlier stage companies, they would typically say, we want to have a cool company, cool culture. I want them all in my location, and that's the smart way to design my business. Okay. So what's the problem with that? Well, the problem is, is you get disruptions, okay? Um, and there's different kinds of disruptions. And I think there's going to be a little bit of a lesson uh, to take away in terms of the kinds of disruptions to prepare for. Uh, for many companies, they have at least some reasonable uh, uh, disruption plans in place for if a internet is lost in their office building or if there's a fire in their office building uh, or some kind of what I call highly localized disruption, that the first move is let's send everybody home. Okay. Um, so what happens if there's a greater disruption? I mean, I remember uh, Hurricane Sandy in New York caused a big disruption. Yeah. So, so, what we've seen uh, so far over the last few weeks, we've got companies who pre-planned for disruption and others who are trying to, to kind of work on the fly because they just weren't quite ready to have a work at home or work at home strategy. So if we go to the next slide, what you'll see is that the typical plan was, hey, we're still cool, but we send everybody home plan in a disruption. And as long as a disruption, you know, uh, is localized to the, your facility and your, your uh, employees are allowed to work from home, that's a legitimate plan. But as you just pointed out, uh, when you have Hurricane Sandy come through where people in the whole geography lose their um, internet or power for weeks or you have a earthquake or a tornado or a volcano eruption or any other kind of disruption, what ends up happening is that highly localized office whose, whose strategy is to send everybody home just simply does not work. Think about Katrina and all the businesses in Louisiana and other parts of uh, the South, Southeast, Southwest uh, after that uh, disaster. They, their businesses were completely wiped out because they were not able to respond to the changes in uh, uh, the conditions and their work work options. Okay, so I have a business, and you know my plan was just send people work from home, but you know hurricane, volcano, something happens, uh, and that's not good enough. What's the next phase? What do I need to do the next level up to fix that? Yeah. So building on that, <clears throat> what I call uh, what I call the next phase, and it's it's kind of like a gradient. Uh, the next next phase is we've pre-planned for disruption, and we're we're pretty smart. We have some geographical diversity. Uh, it looks like this on the on a map. You may have you're still your cool home uh, home office, a couple of satellites, maybe a partner who has some an office internationally, and you say, I can handle it. I can handle some uh, disruptions uh, and so forth. But this also is not quite sturdy enough for different kinds of, uh, of interactions and disruptions to uh, uh, supply chain and workflows. Okay. Well, obviously, we're on a bigger scale. Tell us about what happens with uh, supply chain, if we have a supply chain <clears throat> in the mix. Yeah, so um, so we're in the pandemic, but uh, I think the message and why we titled it disruption, disruption can come from all kinds of 
areas, okay? Um, there was a large conversation up until a couple months ago about the China trade wars, as an example. And um, in the United States, 80 to 90 percent of the U.S. Um, of supply for antibiotics comes out of China. Uh, China could have, in a political trade war, decided to cut us off, and we would have had a significant harm to our society. Uh, that company would have had significant challenges to perform. People have pointed this out now and are raising all kinds of uh, uh, points. We're seeing uh, suppliers starting to, uh, uh, companies starting to diversify their suppliers from one country risk. And um, you're, that, that idea that I have a little bit of diversification, a little bit of geography is still not good enough because one cut of one key process or, or, or whatever can completely disrupt your business. Okay. So what's the answer? Yeah. So, you know, obviously we're looking at a very different situation right now. It's a higher type of disruption and a different kinds of disruption than we're used to. Uh, in this particular case, many people are still able to work at home, but they can't work in what I call refer to as location based businesses because everything is empty because of uh, the lockdown and self-quarantining that everyone is doing. So we're facing empty subways, empty cities, empty airports, empty retail establishments. You know, the world is empty in the normal process of what we're doing. And for some companies, some companies, it's a complete collapse of their business some companies, I believe, are still, and because we're, we're seeing it, they're still operating and continue to operate, you know, at, at very high gear. And I believe that there are going to be companies who are being most affected and industries most affected who are going to rethink how do they set themselves up to be able to handle disruption in any kind of way, and in particular, how do they do it as it relates to their workforce? Uh, Jim, it's been uh, very known for years that uh, particularly IT departments have always thought about uh, disaster recovery plans, and they have backup computer systems and so forth. But what they lack many times now, and this is highlighting it, is they don't have backup plans for their work work strategies. If they lose a location, they don't have a backup plan in place. So, okay. so if we go to the next slide, I'd like to propose for people's thinking that uh, as it relates to uh, setting the stage here, that an ultimate strong strategy looks a little bit like this. I call it a mesh strategy. And basically what you have is you've got multiple offices, um, multiple partners, multiple geographies, capacity to go virtual uh, in across the whole network. And if you do lose something, you have the ability, just like a, a spider web, how strong a spider web is, you have the ability to uh, still have plenty of strength to your web or to your company in a, in a structure that looks a little bit more like what I refer to as the mesh strategy. Uh, okay, so the mesh is the, the visual of all the connecting lines. Is that yeah. correct? Yes, and, and ability to go virtual in all the different locations, et cetera. Okay, so the the mesh strategy, you're confident it could handle uh, various levels of disruption? Not exactly. It's a good question. Okay. Okay, so when you look at this strategy here, you know, the uh, some of the clients who are on today that are international and have big operations, uh, they know this strategy pretty well. But what ends up happening is they are facing a different challenge, okay? And that challenge is, is that you can end up losing, even in a mesh, some part of part or parts of performance in your mesh. And how do you handle 
that break because it isn't just categorically simple to have one part of an organization uh, become uh, unfunctional and that you can automatically just ramp up speed with speed and quickness to accommodate what the, what the business might need during those time periods. So um, the, the idea is, and if we can go to the next slide, is that, um, so in the lower right-hand corner, you know, I put together a chart here that suggests that, uh, let's say a partner goes down in Australia, that if, if that were to happen, that, or, in its, or it's a local office or an important office that goes down for the company, that what they do is they ask their partners typically to have plans in place ahead of time to flex up for them when they are in and having troubles. So in this particular case, as depicted by the bigger uh, red bubbles you know, uh, on this map, when that happens, there's a immediate plan to flex up and be able to cover yourself and so forth. Now, the problem with flexing up is, is if you don't have a partner in a, a, a program that's already in place with some agreed to time periods for ramping up, et cetera, if you go and say, hey, we just lost something and start from ground zero, trying to build a new functionality with a partner or a new location, it, the, the time lag is too critical, can really damage your business. Okay, so you've highlighted two points that seem pretty important. The concept of the mesh and the concept of uh, a partner that can flex is that correct yes yes okay uh so we promised these people uh four smart moves uh you want to go into those uh four smart moves yeah let's do it let's do it all right okay all right that's a good slide all right let's talk about uh these four smart moves Okay, I'm gonna do these really quickly and then give a little bit more color as I go through it. So the first problem that uh, you need to look for or, or, or solve is that you need to plan and prepare to have a mesh. If you don't have a plan, if you haven't done the work ahead of time, you, you, you are gonna really be way behind the, the curve. Number two is that you need to build technology and processes for the new work environments. Okay, and I'm gonna go into that in a lot more detail detail, but uh, the implications from this pandemic is clear that uh, we're going to have a situation where the workforce uh, um, processes are going to need to change in order to be more sturdy. Uh, the third step, as pointed in the uh, um, slide process in the setup, is you need to really diversify your workforces and your partners and get uh, uh, not just really tight in one location and so forth for certain kinds of things. And then ideally have plans in place for flexing up when things go wrong. So those are the four big moves. I'm going to go into them uh, just a little bit more detail and then share some uh, what I think are some winner loser ideas. Okay, so let's uh, go into more detail about the first one. Yeah, so um, so this uh, slide came about, we started at Bold Business. Uh, we un uh, have undergone, we haven't completed it yet. We were working a workforce strategy 2020 report and I've been interviewing CEOs to bake basically take census of where their, how their organizations are structured and how well established are they and uh, how would they respond to different kinds of disruptions. At the end of the day, you have to start with an audit. You have to then look at what kind of plans might you be able to put in place. You need to assess your, assess your talents, uh, look at a roadmap in terms of how might you get there over some time and also to create some kind of contingency partner plan that can step into place and solve things uh, when that. So the first step is start to plan. Okay, what's the second step? Okay, so uh, I want to distinguish this a little bit because I think the two kinds of companies are very important. I refer to knowledge-based companies and, and product location dependent companies. Can you give us an example of a knowledge-based company? Sure. Knowledge-based companies could be architects, could be software development firms, lawyers, accountants, any kind of uh, 
organization that has a high degree of knowledge bases. Uh, they don't have a physical product that somebody has to come in and pick up and take back home, you know, um, or you're doing business. The uh, uh, product-based companies are a little bit different in that they have a product that they're selling and you got to somehow get it to a consumer or a business. So in many cases, they need people in locations to be able to assist them and be able to get the products, you know, into the final customer's hands. Okay. So what do knowledge-based companies have to do? Well, I think we're seeing a little bit of that right now. Um, you know, uh, some of our partners and some of our clients are, 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 there's just an explosion of, of need for how can I set up virtual work, you know, in a smarter way? How can I establish setting up my company to be open all the time when there is a disruption, whether it's my own workforce working at home or a other uh, uh, aspect of it where you have your partners who are situated to do uh, to be able to do the same. There's all kinds of technology implications, security implications, and how these processes work when you push them all out into the uh, virtual world. But um, there is a very, uh, it's a very different roadmap for companies that are in the knowledge base system, because for a lot of them, they'll say, well, I'm a lawyer, I got a law firm, I sent them all home, I guess I'm okay. Well, they're really not okay long term if, again, if a different kinds of disruption impact their ability to perform. Okay. Uh, you were talking about product based companies, and I, and I uh, know that you have an idea, new business idea for a product dependent company. Yeah. You know, so. Uh, how about this one, everybody? Uh, we're gonna we're gonna look at starting, and maybe we can crowdsource the funding right now today. Uh, well, why don't we start a No Touch R Us grocery service? The grocery service you deserve. What we will have is human contact free groceries. You know, robots will put them on the shelves. They'll put them in bags. They'll scan them. You pull up in your car. The robotic arm will put it into your car for you. And you'll be open 24. It'll be open 24 by 7 and uh, never touched by a human being. Uh, I like this idea. <laughs> Well, I will tell you that, you know, uh, Jim, we did a very uh, good report on, on this in December before the pandemic hit. We talked about how the grocery store chain was moving, you know, towards a uh, more of an automated basis. You know, obviously Amazon uh, Go has a little bit of a program like that now. You you go in and you take your your groceries off the shelf and put them in your cart and bag them yourself, and they know they already charge you. But there's still humans put touching the product before it goes up on the shelves and all that type of thing. So um, I. What we're going to see, though, I think very, uh, very different post pandemic is um, so many people who are in these jobs would right now prefer to be running a robot, you know, in a back room that was sanitized and just picking up the groceries and putting them in bags for people versus being the actual person who's have to put their hands on the same product that the customer just put their hands on and having the germs and the pandemic risk that they're all having. You know, we're seeing this in, uh, you know, the Amazon warehouses, we're seeing it in any environment where there's high touch, that the, the, the uh, line workers who were before very resistant to the idea of automation are going to probably say, I if you give me a, a smart way to do it where I don't have to be exposed, I would be happy to do so. Okay. So uh, you're painting a picture of a life that's going to be pretty much different after uh, this whole pandemic thing uh, blows through. What's on the up? What's on the down? Sure. Well, um, so here's a few few thoughts here. Um, I think that personal transport is going to come back on the up. 
Um, I think uh, on the down is going to be stuff subways and buses and everything else uh, based on social distancing rules and everything. People are going to be a lot more nervous about using mass transport. I think that uh, companies and uh, people are going to say, I think uh, having my own closed in environment out in a suburb versus being in a common air filtered building, you know, that could pa- possibly be passing uh, the germs through the environment might be there. I think um, you're going to see robotic cashiers and baggers versus human cashiers and baggers. And I think the next slide, we have a bunch more, you know, of thoughts of, of what I think will be accelerated um, uh um, initiatives that businesses will change. Virtual medicine, as an example, versus if you go to the lower right hand corner, crowded doctor's offices. Um, we're going to see an explosion. Uh, the government has clearly gotten, you know, um, and made it easier for virtual medicine to take off right now in view of the pandemic. But I don't think it's going to go away, you know, afterwards. This is, this is now. Uh, going to start grabbing significant um, uh, route into our society and delivery systems. And virtual medicine is going to clearly be on the up as a result of this. It's going to have implications to networks, how doctors uh, are all set up, how delivery is made. But uh, virtual medicine is you know, clearly going to be there. Remote learning for school, um, you're going to see uh, takeout and drive throughs versus packed restaurants. I think the social distancing, you're going to probably see restaurants that are going to have a section of the uh, of their uh, restaurant, which will uh, adhere to social distancing uh, requirements. And then if you're if you're brave and want to be exposed to more uh, germs, you can have the non-social distancing section of the, uh, uh, you know, of the restaurant, um, you know, so there's going to be a lot of uh, different changes here. Also, obviously, and I, I don't want to uh, save this as a last one, but uh, working from home is going to be a lot more accepted now. Virtual workers are going to be much more, after we're done with these two or three months, people are going to say, hey, we kind of figured this out. I think we could work virtually a little bit more. I I believe that the shared offices and the big commercial uh, real estate is going to be on the down. How quickly, how big is another question. There's always going to be a need for people to be, you know, in a location, uh, but it could get uh, altered quite dramatically, you know, particularly if if companies started adopting uh, some of these mesh strategies. Okay. Uh, we were up to number three in the uh, four strong moves. Yes. So, um, so the other aspect of the three three steps is you really need to come up with a plan to diversify yourself. Um, and uh, as the slide says, I won't read every component, but I think one of the key points is to uh, start moving towards a. Uh, different geography, you know, limit your risks based on some of the points that we had and also start adopting technologies. Just as an example, and I'll go back to that grocery store, uh, uh, a hands-free, touch-free grocery store. There is no reason why people who are running the robots who are doing the pack, packing of, of uh, a particular uh, person's bags or uh, doing the shopping for them has to be in the location at all. They could be doing it literally from a virtual, just like a video game from a, a virtual, you know, uh, location uh, connected to the company's uh, 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 systems and doing all the work uh, remotely and not necessarily in the same geographies so that if they lose a few people due to sickness or, or any kind of disruption, they've got a plan in place to flex back up. Okay. You mentioned that uh, magic word flex. Uh, I think yeah. that is number four has to do with flex. Exactly. So one of the one of the concepts here is um, so uh, you know I'm gonna maybe date myself a little bit, but I'm a big fan of uh, Super Mario <laughs> and Toad, which is the name of the mushroom, gives Super Mar- Mario extra powers. And, you know, what what I think we need is uh, and companies need to be thinking about is that um, 
we all need need the equivalent of that mushroom toad in our in our uh, arsenals going forward. So, hey, I need to have a partner who could flex up, go into super super status, add the hundreds of people or whatever it is to take over an office that just went down or a function that went down. You know, um, some of some of the partners that we we do business with in the telco field know this very well. They have a variety of different contingency plans for hurricanes and things to have partners who can come in and help bring service back in the case of disruptions. But um, it's not unique just to those industries. This is something that I think most companies are going to start start asking themselves, how can I flex up when I lose something and how can I uh, handle that? So you're going to have two suppliers and you're going to say if one supplier is in, is unable to perform, how quickly can you ramp up? For that short period of time, they may have to pay up for it, but it's much better than having uh, no capability or not being able to deliver to your end clients and damaging your business long term. So I think everybody needs, uh, Jim, the Super Mario plan. Uh, I got to admit, uh, I played Super Mario a lot and never once knew that the mushroom was named Toad. Oh, is that right? Well, we, yeah. we okay, but he's that's that's who that's that's who the mushroom's name is. <laughs> wow, nice. Uh, okay, so opportunities. Let's talk about the opportunities. Yeah, sure. So, um, so this is really a you know somewhat uh, kind of a. Uh, almost a wrap up compared to how we went through, you know, all disruptions that happen, you know, in the marketplace, always, there's always winners, losers. Okay. And as I pointed out, like even with the product based companies, you're probably going to see drone delivery increase. You're going to see robotic demand increase. You're going to see virtualization services increase. You're going to see more demand for complex networks and security for people who are spread out all over the world and how do we protect from ransomwares and all the other kinds of things. So there's going to be clear winners and there's going to be clear, uh, I won't, I don't like the word losers, but it's going to be, they're not going to come back in the same way or, or get as much of the economic pie as they did uh, post pandemic. But, um, and I believe that the companies who are uh, adapting now to this environment and getting ready for the new world are going are you know are going to have numerous opportunities that could that they could benefit from. Okay, uh, I think it's question time, and uh, I have a question: uh, How does cybersecurity factor into all this? Well, um, so this is very interesting question, and thank you for that, whoever. By the way, um, I know from looking at the list that our uh, audience today is global. We've got people all over the world logged in, uh, and appreciate all of you taking taking the time at uh, whether it's morning, you know, late evening or middle of the night for you. Um, I appreciate uh, people being on the call today. So the cybersecurity issue, one of the things we've seen, we, we have a, a pretty well uh, established cybersecurity consulting uh, business and companies are literally very concerned about the whole move to virtual. You've got all kinds of different issues like storage on your home laptops and what, how does it go out the door? You got HIPAA regulations and other kinds of regulations that say, how do I protect information that used to be in a, in a safe environment in my office and now has to be somehow touched or supported in a, in a remote location? Uh, how easy is it for a, uh, uh, a hacker to get into a individual's personal network? Network and possibly be able to infect a corporate network from a home uh, uh, protection environment. So uh, there's uh, there's a lot of different uh, elements to this, uh, and I think that you know companies are trying to get their arms around it as quickly as possible. Uh, and again, you know, I think that it's just not as simple as just send people home. Okay. Uh, another question. You talked about flexing up and partners being able to flex up. Um, what is that? What would that look like in terms of a uh, contract? Okay, so um, yeah, we've we've done this for a bunch of years. We have clients that will say, "If X happens, 
we would like an agreement in place for the future that if X happens, you will be prepared to deliver a uh, at some level of Y uh, for us within a, a agreed to time period that allows us to have an understanding of when you could be operational and flexing up in a full capacity. Uh, in most of those cases, uh, those kind of contracts are in place with existing clients who we already have knowledge of their work uh, um work uh, processes, because if you just called up a random company and said, hey, I'd like you to help me with some back office functions, but you never did them before and you don't know anything about it, and I need them up in two to four weeks, it's almost impossible. Um, so, you know, the ideal uh, program is I think we're going to see more contracts being written with a, with flex provisions in them. You know, many of them will be short term. You know, it's like I want you to be able to bring you know, some capability for three months or six months if we have a disaster of some kind, you know, and then disappear. And, you know, there's some complexity to all of that, you know, uh, overall. But I think we're going to see a lot more flex contracts going forward. Okay. Uh, this is a question from me. Uh, a year ago, the pitch coming across the plate was all about cybersecurity. Uh, this latest curveball is uh, pandemics and, and lockdowns. And what's the next pitch going to be? What do you what do you foresee? Ooh. Well, well, Jim, I think um, I'm I I tend to have an optimistic view of the world long term, and um, I think the pandemic is the second pitch, but the third pitch is the hard one that we haven't we're just getting ready to face, which is we we had uh, six million plus unemployed. Uh, uh, people uh, file for unemployment uh, this past week. Um, the projections are literally scary about what these numbers could be. The e economic uh, disruption and destruction that this pandemic is causing is um, our third pitch. We're going to have to rebuild and um, we're all going to have to, you know, kind of, you know, dig deep and uh, understand that some things may may not come back ever again, uh, or or won't come back in the same way. Uh, and as I said, there'll be new things that will happen that will get accelerated as a red as a result of this. So the pandemic is just pitch two. We have pitch three already. Uh, you know, it's already left the pitcher's hand. Okay. We just, uh, I guess if we're staying with that baseball analogy, um, but it's already left the pitcher's hand and we're, we're going to, we're, we, are, we, are, we as a world, it's not just, uh, you know, the United States, we as a world are going to have to have to, um, kind of be prepared to suck it up and, you know, let's get the rebuild going, you know, and get, get, get and do what uh, human, human beings have done forever is rebuilt themselves after any kind of tragedy. Okay. Just got a question that came through with product or even service firms, you still have to have human contact. Are you saying that automation will be ramped up quicker now because of the pandemic? Yeah, so I am saying that there will be more automation as a result of the pandemic. Okay, so I think you'll, you know, you're going to see it in a lot of different ways, you know, retail, uh, food, you know, uh, restaurants, there's going to just be different um, uh, approaches to the delivery of products. Uh, in the case of services, um, I think that the service industry, so, some of it is just not changeable when you start thinking about, you know, nurses and care workers and other types of people, you can do some things. I mean, we, we, uh, um, have done work in hospitals, to, you know, uh, along the way and the technology that is going into hospitals to be able to stay abreast and monitor people and the sophisticated networks and monitoring gears that they put in there are just amazing. And it does reduce the need for human contact, but it's not going to eliminate it. Uh, so I think we're going it, to, it's not an all or none, you know, type of situation. Um, you know, I, I clearly went, uh, you know, and wanted to kind of get everybody's attention with the hands-free grocery store. 
But I, I think the more practical sense is, is that we're going to move in a direction, maybe a little faster than we were doing before into more automated robotic and, um, you know, less direct human touch uh, environments. Okay. Uh, so we're running out of time. Let's uh, wrap this up. Uh, thank you, Ed, for uh, taking the time with us. Thank you. I pre appreciate the uh, opportunity to talk about this today. And uh, I truly do hope for everyone who's uh, on the call today that you're um, handling, you know, everything as best as you can. It's rough times for all of us. Um, but I, I do believe that, you know, the spirit of, you know, hum humankind is, uh, is very strong and we will not only beat the pandemic, but we will also uh, recover and thrive again as a world as we do dig our way out of this. I hope some of the ideas that I, uh, uh, offered up today, uh, gave you some uh, reason to uh, think or apply it to your own company situations. And uh, we're always available to talk some more if you've got any kind of specific uh, uh, help or, or needs that you'd like to have. Okay. All right. Well, thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, remember, this will be up on boldbusiness.com tomorrow and uh, be safe out there.